And um, I think you're going to have a great, a great couple of days. And I, I don't know how many of you are staying for the uh, workshop as well that follows. So this whole event is a five-day event all the way from today through Sunday, uh, January 8th. Um, my name is Tom Cope, Dean of the College. I've been here in uh, Tucson now for five years, and I'm still fascinated with Tucson. I just love it here. Um, uh, those of you from the East Coast, I think, are probably pretty happy to see the weather outside and uh, the sunshine that you're going to get uh, throughout this period. Um, we also have very unusual flora and fauna. So these pictures, I didn't have to go far. Actually, every one of these animal pictures was taken from inside my bedroom, um, <laughs> just looking out the door um, of the animals walking by. And this is about a 30-foot uh, saguaro cactus, and I've got about 100 of those on my property. So uh, it's a beautiful place to live, and if you're from the east, there's just so many things that are different. These, some of these animals you just won't see back there. This is the famous javelina. It's like a little pig that runs around. Um, they're actually peccaries, but they travel in herds of up to about 30. And um, they look friendly, but uh, keep away from them because they, they have little tusks hidden under there, and they, uh, they'll take out a dog if they get in a dog fight. So. And then, of course, tortoises, roadrunners, gila monsters, and our famous uh, rattlesnake, too, which you want to keep away from. But we're here for the, um, for the uh, workshop and uh, winter school. And first, I want to recognize the efforts of a lot of people who went into making this uh, what we hope to be a very successful and exciting event. Um, so the, the local uh, committee here is Paul Yesen, Jason Jones, Daiwo Kim, John Koshal, Masood Mansurpur, and Judy Sue. And I know about half of them are here. Maybe you could raise your hands, those of you who are here. So that's Paul in the back, Jason in the second to last row, Masood, and then uh, Daiwo here. And I know Judy. Uh, and John will be showing up uh, later in the day. We also had the assistance of an external advisory committee, some of whom may be here. I, I haven't met you if you're here, and uh, maybe you could raise your hands if you are. Uh, okay, so they, will, uh, they may be participating later. What's very important is that we had an incredible sponsorship. This is the second time we've uh, held this event, so it's kind of an experiment. And um, the first event was just last year, and this year, it's nearly uh, doubled in size, uh, due in large part to a lot of support from these uh, enterprises. Individuals, uh, foundations, NSF, OSA, SPIE. TRIF is a state of Arizona uh, fund for research and education. Um, so we're very, very thankful to these organizations for supporting this event for you. Um, so throughout, uh, we're also very happy this time to try to expand the scope of this. Um, so you're going to have some presentations, not just from faculty here at the College of Optical Sciences, but from some of the other premier institutions in the field of optics and photonics, University of Rochester and uh, Creole, University of Central Florida. And um, they will be speaking about their academic programs. We actually don't have a, a talk here about specifically about our academic program. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a picture about what the University of Arizona is all about. So we're a, a big school, founded uh, a land-grant university founded back in uh, 1865, about 40,000 students. And there's a whole bunch of colleges, College of Science, College of Optical Sciences, uh, agriculture, and so on and so on. So many different colleges, lots of different uh, undergraduate and graduate programs. We're, we're a research one university, so we have a very high kind of dollar volume of research uh, spanning a, a lot of stuff. One of the areas we're very, very well known for is uh, space sciences and, and optics. And those programs, in particular, the space programs with NASA, uh, tend to be large, huge funded programs. So that helps put us up in the top one, two, or three uh, in the entire nation in terms of uh, research funding in physical sciences, which is space, chemistry, and physics. Um, you might be familiar with some of the big science programs we do. Uh, one of the ones that's uh, just got a lot of airplay was the Osiris-Rex asteroid landing mission that, uh, that launched uh, just about a month ago now, or maybe three weeks. I, I can't remember what the exact launch date was. About a month. And uh, it's going to co-orbit with an asteroid um, and then actually land on the asteroid, pick up a sample, and then bring it back to Earth. That'll be the first time that that's been able to be done. 
Um, so we do large programs, some of which uh, are associated with huge telescopes and astronomy, and you'll hear about those uh, shortly. Um, here we are, buried in the, along the mall here. So if you get out and you look along that big corridor, you're looking east towards the Rincon Mountains. North of us are the Catalina Mountains. And here is the College of Optical Sciences, which is actually comprised of three buildings. Uh, we hope soon to be four. We're, uh, we're looking to expand uh, once again in the relatively near future. Um, by the numbers, we, we are the largest uh, optics and photonics program for education and research in the US. And that's whether you measure that by the dollar volume of the research programs that we have going on at the graduate level or just the number of degrees that are being awarded each year. Um, we have about 60 faculty that split almost equally between tenure, tenure track faculty, which have a lot of uh, research and teaching responsibilities. And then we also have some, about 30 pure research faculty who primarily aren't uh, teaching, but they're, they're conducting research uh, funded by their own grants. And then we also have about, we're, we're like tentacles across the whole university. So we have faculty that are woven into programs all the way from the obvious ones like astronomy and, and physics, but also in other programs in biomedical engineering, material science, and so forth. And throughout this uh, uh, couple of days, you'll hear presentations to try to give you a sense of the scope of the kinds of things that are going on. Um, we have a very large uh, student body dominated by graduate students back in 64 when the college was founded. It was purely a graduate uh, center for, for uh, supporting masters and PhD students. About 20 years ago, we expanded in, and had an undergraduate program as well. And now we've got about 35 students per class, something like that. Um, students don't enter as undergraduates until they're uh, sophomore year, and that's because we don't go to high schools and try to convince students to enroll in the College of Optical Sciences. They don't even know what it is. Uh, and that's part of what this program is all about, is to give you a better sense of uh, all the things you can do in the field of optics and uh, photonics. So lots of uh, PhDs awarded over the last uh, 50 years. We had our 50th anniversary just uh, two years ago. Um, so optics and photonics. Everybody always thinks, you know, you, you tell somebody on the bus or on the airplane, what do you do? Oh, I work in uh, optics. And they go, oh, you know, can you fix the little hinge on my eyeglass? <laughs> um, and the answer is, yeah, we, we do things like this. You'll hear talks about remarkable advances in the field of ophthalmology. And, and uh, in fact, our next speaker will, uh, will talk some, somewhat about that. But the reality is that there's a lot more going on in the field of optics and photonics. And that's really what this uh, entire event is about is to try to reach out to some of the best talent in the country, namely you, and try to share with you the excitement that we all feel about the field of optics and photonics to, uh, to see if we can interest you into thinking about this a little harder as a possible career direction. Maybe you've already made up your minds and you're going to do it, but if you're on the brink, we'd like to get you over the edge and uh, convince you to do it. So this, this is a... Uh, uh, a little quote that I thought was kind of funny. One of our graduate students had that in his presentation. Right? Kind of a pun. Optics is everywhere you look. Well, of course it is. You're using your eyes. Um, so it was just kind of a silly. Um, the objective of the winter school. So there's two events. The winter school followed by the workshop. The objective of this winter school is to uh, give all of you an overview of, uh, of the, very, the different areas of optics. Um, and we are among the broadest uh, here at the College of Optical Sciences, but we don't cover everything. No, no one institution can do everything that's going on in the field of optics. So we'd like to share, uh, have outside speakers coming in as well, and just try to give you a broad a, a picture as we can of the things that are involved in the study of optics and photonics. Again, trying to encourage more of you to pursue uh, a career. What we're really going to be sharing with you a lot is research in this field. And um, as undergraduates, some of you may have been exposed to research uh, working with some of the faculty at your uh, colleges, but not everyone. And I like to think of research as, um, you know, we all think we're very smart, but research really is trying to do something that you don't have a clue how to do. Um, and it takes a lot of nerve to do that. You know, if, you could, if you go and try to do something you already know how to do, that's not really research so much. So you're trying to design something that you don't know how to design. You're trying to measure something that nobody's ever measured. 
you're trying to um, make something that you have some vague idea how to make it, and it doesn't work. You get a bloody nose, you go back and you try it again, and you try it again. And when you get done with this, you've got something new. And that's what research is really all about, is, is creating new knowledge. That's what a PhD is really a measure of. When you get a PhD, it's kind of a cert certificate. Uh, it's, it's evidence through your thesis and the work that you did that you're able to add new knowledge to the field, not just be a practitioner, but to create uh, new things that other people can use and stand on. So here at the College of Optical Sciences, we, we don't have different departments. We have different research areas, and you'll be hearing talks throughout the day on these different areas. Uh, optical physics, um, I'm sure all of you have had some exposure to physics, and, um, but, but the kinds of things people do here are uh, really remarkable. I'm not going to try to capture it here because you'll hear, hear those talks, but all the way from uh, uh, wacky quantum soups where you can microscopically cancel out one blob of matter with another one and, and see it with your own eyes. It's, it's crazy stuff. Um, extreme nonlinear optics and so forth. Um, optical engineering and design is what you may think of when you first think of optics. It's engineering optical systems, imaging systems um, that might be used for a, for a lithography system to print microelectronic circuits, or it might be used with a remote sensing, or it might be a new kind of microscope, or uh, anything like that, or a giant telescope, as you'll hear about. Uh, image science is really the mathematics of image information and uh, manipulation. Uh, how do you quantify the amount of information in an image? How do you know that you've designed a system that optimizes your ability to get the information you're looking for? So it's an interesting hybrid, hybrid between physical systems that people engineer, but they co-engineer them with algorithms in mind about how they're going to optimize the information extraction. A lot, of, uh, a lot of applications in life sciences, is it a tumor or not a tumor? Uh, astronomy, is that an exoplanet or not an exoplanet? Uh, things like that. And then photonics, which is my own uh, background in uh, field, and I'll be talking about that more this afternoon, so I, uh, I think I have a whole hour to talk about it with you today, so I won't waste time more on that. So here's a, a snapshot of the agenda for today. Um, after this welcome, uh, we'll hear a talk by uh, Jim Schweigerling on, uh, on optical engineering. Uh, a talk by Dai Wook on uh, Dai Wook Kim on astronomy, and then some more on optics of the human eye with John Grievenkamp. And then, as I said, I'll talk to you on photonics, and then some nanophotonics, and then ending the day with uh, a nice talk on uh, solar energy and, um, and some of the optics that Roger Angel has done. He was the mastermind behind the giant mirror capability that we have here at the University of Arizona. Some lab tours and then dinner, and then tomorrow, uh, we resume with more talks, again, trying to cover all these different application areas of optics and photonics. Again, lab tours and free time at the end of the day, and then a nice dinner with a poster session and a, uh, and a welcome reception for the uh, workshop that then follows the next day. So the following three days, then uh, Saturday, I'm sorry, uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday are uh, this uh, winter workshop, which is really focusing on careers. In the field of optics, it's focusing on education. So uh, professors at primarily undergraduate institutions coming and sharing some of their, um, their concepts about how to improve teaching. Again, how to attract more students, how to do a better job uh, in the field of optics and photonics. And those of you who may be staying to participate in that, your input is really important because you're the ones who have most recently experienced this and your views uh, are really valuable. But also there will be more talks on, uh, on research going on at some of the other institutions across the United States. This is an eye chart, and I apologize. I, one day I couldn't even fit on there, but lots of talks covering everything from uh, programs in uh, engineering at different schools like Creole, uh, optics and photonics, to people sharing their early career experiences. Um, we're lucky to have a, a wonderful keynote address. You're all probably aware of the uh, LIGO experiment, the first detection of uh, gravity waves, and the director of that entire program uh, came here to speak to this small group. Uh, that's how much passion uh, this individual has for sharing what they're able to do. And that's one of the most uh, amazing optical instruments you could ever imagine. Uh, it's got interferometer arms that are kilometers long, I think four kilometers long, and it's so sensitive with these huge hanging masses on glass fibers that it can measure a displacement that's one ten thousandth 
the diameter of a proton. Uh, it's, it's just crazy, and it works. And uh, so he'll talk to you about that uh, instrument and, and what they've been able to do. On uh, Saturday, again, more talks, uh, same kind of flavor, and I don't have time to go through it, but you see the speakers are from all across the nation. Some of them may be your, uh, your speakers. I mean, I'm sorry, your faculty at your institutions. You may recognize the names. And then on Sunday, we wrap up around lunch, and then we go out to the uh, Arizona Sonora Desert Museum, where you'll get to see some of the things I showed you on the first slide, perhaps, uh, and some of the flora and fauna, and then have a nice dinner out there as well. So I think the weather, we hope, will hold up, and it should be a beautiful experience. And with that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end this. I, I guess I do want to say one more thing. So lots of us have other things we're supposed to be doing. I'm supposed to be two other places right now. Um, <laughs> And I elected to come here just as our faculty are here. Classes don't start for another week. Um, faculty from across the country are coming here. And we're doing it because there's nothing more important than you. Um, you are the future of our field. Um, we will drop whatever we're doing to try to um, share with you our excitement. And uh, that's what this couple of days is all about. So with that, I want to introduce our uh, first speaker. Uh, Jim Schwigerling, who's going to talk to you about introduction to optical engineering. And we'll probably be doing hot swaps of laptops throughout the day. So, um, Logistics, I guess you, you've all been in the lobby out there. You know there's a restroom right here on this floor. If that one's full, go up the stairs, and there's another set of restrooms um, down the hall across the uh, causeway. Um, and with that, I will hand you off to Jim. Oh, microphone. Yes. Thanks, sir. Got to wait for the opening credits here. All right. Good morning, everybody. So, uh, um, Today I've been asked to uh, give you guys an introduction to optical engineering. And so my goal here is really uh, to give a very broad overview of just some of the topics uh, that go on in the field and some of the things that you may be working on uh, if you uh, uh, end up uh, coming here and, and pursuing um, a degree in optical engineering. And so again, this is going to be very high level. Uh, and obviously, I can't uh, even begin to touch on all the different possibilities here. I just kind of went through a stream of consciousness and, and tried to make some connections to just some, some things that I think are kind of cool um, that uh, 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 involve uh, optical engineering. So uh, first, let's uh, take a high-level view and say, OK, what is optics? So optics is a branch of physics that deals with light. And I put light in quotes, and I'll... I'll uh, I'll uh, explain that in a little bit here, uh, and the interaction of light with itself, its properties, and with, uh, with matter. And somewhere in one of your physics class, you probably uh, have done problems like this, where we have a little lens and an object and an image and figure out the magnification and stuff like that. And I just want to emphasize that this is the most probably basic problem in optics, and that really there's so much more than this. And so that's, those are the types of things that I, I want to highlight today. I want to go beyond what you've, you've gotten in your physics classes and, uh, uh, and uh, hit some, some other um, higher level things. So uh, optical engineers, OK? So uh, we kind of distinguish between optical scientists and optical engineers. So optical scientists are really uh, people who are looking at what are the fundamental properties of uh, light and, and its interaction with, with matter. So just for the sake of really trying to understand how these things work uh, for, uh, for those purposes. Uh, optical engineers are people who take uh, those properties and try to 
make something with them, okay? Uh, so optical engineers design and build practical devices, and the devices can be, you know, a consumer product like uh, your cell phone camera, or it could be a one-off like a giant telescope who, uh, I think Daiwook will give you several examples of, of some of the giant telescopes that, that uh, we work on. And the idea here is that you want to do something useful. You want to be able to take a selfie, or you want to take a picture of an exoplanet around um, uh, some uh, far-off uh, star. Uh, in optical engineering, you're typically uh, looking at uh, several things. One is it's physically possible, so we can't violate the laws of physics. So uh, you have to know uh, all about these uh, optical properties and uh, is the thing that you're trying to do even physically possible. But you're also looking at what's the available technology and what are the uh, available materials and how do I leverage these? How do I put these together and assemble them into something that can uh, achieve the, the, the goal uh, that I'm doing? And uh, reasonable cost is always, always a nice thing. And so reasonable cost uh, depends on the, uh, the product. So for your cell phone camera, you know, the elements in there may be, you know, costing pennies or dollars and, and that kind of stuff because you uh, uh, need to make, you know, a billion of them to, uh, to supply the world. Reasonable cost for one of these telescopes may be tens of millions of dollars uh, or more, hundreds of millions. Um, in optical engineering, you need to be uh, familiar with all sorts of different uh, types of optical components and elements. So typically we're interested in sources, uh, optical elements, and detectors of, uh, of light. So sources can be star, uh, lasers, LEDs, light bulbs, um, that kind of stuff. Uh, uh, optical elements can be lenses mirrors, prisms, uh, fiber optics, uh, for instance, so something that will take light from the sources and uh, send it somewhere else. And then uh, detectors, uh, so probably the most common one, human eyeball, okay, uh, CMOS sensor uh, that you find in most uh, digital imaging stuff. And you guys, anybody know what this is? <laughs> Are you guys old enough to, to know that? So, uh, film. So, um, optical engineers, let's uh, define this a little more. So, so Tom had hit on this uh, a little bit. So, optical engineers are not opticians, optometrists, or ophthalmologists. So, an optician is somebody who makes eyeglasses. Okay? An optometrist is somebody who uh, measures you and measures your prescription to fit eyeglasses or to fit contact lenses. And an ophthalmologist is a, a medical doctor that typically uh, does uh, surgery and uh, treatment of various eye diseases. And so optical engineers aren't any of those things, and they're often commonly mistaken for, for one of the, the first two here. Um, but instead, um, we may deal with, um, deal with, uh, uh, these people and uh, come up with the devices that they use uh, in their surgeries and their treatments uh, and their fabrication techniques uh, in order to do this. So this is a uh, fairly old uh, device uh, at this point. So this is called a four-opter and those of you who wear glasses or contact lenses are pretty familiar with this. Basically there's just a uh, giant wheel of lenses in here and you look through it and they twiddle the knobs here and say, is this one better, is this one better? And systematically they kind of guide you through until you can hopefully uh, see the outside world uh, clearly. And then they look at these little numbers and turn that into your uh, prescription. Um, now, that's a fairly b basic device, even though it looks fairly complicated in, in terms of all the knobs there. The mechanical stuff is probably much more complicated than the optics that are in there. But uh, we may uh, do things like look at the next generation version of, uh, of this device. And so this is a, uh, a system that we've built in uh, my lab. And uh, so your eyeballs go down here. And basically, you can look straight through uh, this system at an eye chart off on the wall and stuff like that. 
Um, however, there's a bunch of other things going on here. So uh, each the sides here are mirror images of one another, but you have a uh, infrared beam that uh, comes into your eye. Can't really see, it's just a faint red dot. Um, and that light uh, actually probes your eye and comes back out and gets sent down this channel here to a uh, wavefront sensor. So a wavefront sensor is a device that measures the uh, shape of the uh, wavefront coming out of your eye. So it can tell you things like how much uh, refractive error you have, how much astigmatism you have, and how much uh, aberration you have. And then that information comes back and goes into a uh, series of fluidic lenses here. Now, what's a fluidic lens? Well, it's exactly what it sounds like. You have a glass plate and a deformable membrane with fluid inside, and you can push and pull fluid in and out of there, and you can change the shape of that membrane. So you can change the power, the focal length of the lens in front of it. And so this automatically measures your eye, determines what your prescription is, pushes and pulls fluid out of the lenses to cancel that out, and ideally the eye chart should uh, become clear um, uh, at the end when you look through there. So let me just uh, pop through here. So that's the, the whole system here. And uh, this kind of just shows the path. So the light coming back out of the eye gets measured at the wavefront sensor there. Uh, this is one of the fluidic lenses. And we actually stack three of these on top of one another. And so there's one that's rotationally symmetric, which lets you change your nearsightedness or farsightedness. And then there's two of them that have this sort of rectangular shape. And what that does is that introduces astigmatism. And by modulating the amount of fluid in each one of these three lenses, we can do your sphere, cylinder, and axis at any uh, sort of uh, orientation to uh, correct your uh, prescription. Now, one of the uh, big questions that we always got with these fluidic lenses is, what about gravity, okay? So you have this deformable membrane with the fluid and you expect it to kind of sag and uh, just deform so that it kind of bulges at the, at the bottom uh, due to gravity. Well, uh, we uh, uh, sought to answer that question to, uh, uh, to look at that. And so one of the ways you can uh, see what the issues are with gravity is to avoid gravity. So, and we couldn't go all the way up into space with them, but uh, uh, one of my students was fortunate enough to go on what's affectionately known as the Vomit Comet. And so this is an uh, airplane that sort of does one of these types of things. And so as you come up here, you experience a couple Gs, and as you're going down here, you experience weightlessness. And so you alternate between uh, these two states here, and you actually have uh, uh, about two minutes of uh, free fall or, uh, or lack of gravity and stuff like that. And so you gotta do your experiments very, very quickly every time the plane is uh, going through this, this bottom arc here. So uh, uh, Carl, my student on the left here, uh, set up an experiment where we were running um, uh, these fluidic lenses and we were shining a beam uh, through them and uh, looking at the uh, uh, various distortion aberrations that are, are uh, introduced uh, through the different uh, levels of, of uh, gravity. And so they just got the all clear signal that uh, they can start things and kind of work very quickly here. And uh, there's probably about a dozen other experiments going on simultaneously in here. Um, this guy doesn't look, look <laughs> too good over here. He, he's not one of ours, ours though, so. <laughs> so. So, uh, so uh, yeah, at, at the end of this, the, the, the masses that we're dealing with here are very, very low, and so the, the distortions that we're seeing due to gravity are pretty insignificant compared to, um, compared to uh, uh, what we're trying to do. Um, now, at the beginning of my talk here, I um, 
I put on a, uh, I put uh, the word light in quotes when I defined what optics is. And so technically light is uh, you know, part of the electromagnetic spectrum uh, that stimulates our vision. And so it's wavelengths between 400 and 700 nanometers, so blue to red roughly. Uh, but uh, we got kind of confined by those constraints because this is just a little sliver of the whole electromagnetic spectrum there. So we really try to uh, push out uh, from there uh, when we talk about optics. And so when we talk about optics, we really start going out into uh, sort of the far infrared, so wavelengths about 10 microns, and then down to um, the uh, bottom of the ultraviolet, so 100 nanometers. And these are kind of fuzzy borders, if you will. Um, and uh, so we really operate on systems all uh, throughout uh, this range here. And that's because we can find materials that look like lenses uh, that will uh, operate uh, in these bands, and we can find sensors that uh, can uh, detect uh, this radiation easier. If you start going to uh, longer and longer wavelengths, you start getting into uh, detection schemes where you're using more antennas and electronics and, and those types of things. And if you go too far this way, uh, uh, the uh, EM wave likes to just pretty much go right through just about everything that you, uh, you put in front of it. And so, um, so it kind of puts constraints on it. So when we say optics, it's really this ultraviolet through infrared uh, range that's, uh, uh, that we're mostly dealing with. Um, now, I showed you a very simple lens where we have an object and an image, but in actuality, uh, the combination of lenses uh, that we use are, are far more uh, complicated uh, in order to get uh, really good image quality. So if you take your digital SLR and you uh, cut it in half, uh, you might find 10 or 15 elements in there in order to give you a really high quality sharp image that takes uh, advantage of the, uh, the resolution uh, that's in there. Uh, and then you may have a situation where you can move uh, some of these lenses independently of one another and create a zoom effect. And so you can change the focal length of the lens or you can change the magnification and the field of view of the lens uh, and have good image quality over um, a whole uh, range of, uh, of systems. And so uh, the uh, sophistication and complexity of, uh, of developing lenses goes well beyond uh, that, that single lens that, uh, that we saw. I and mean, you have to understand how all these uh, interact with, with one another um, in order to get uh, good image quality. And so a lot of times you can uh, build systems that operate in the visible wavelength or, uh, you know, used for things like taking selfies with your, your, uh, your cell phone cameras. Uh, but you can also do things like uh, take pictures of uh, the surface of Mars. So this is the um, southern um, uh, uh, pole of, uh, of Mars. And this is taken from a camera called High Rise. And it was built across the street here. Okay, so most of the images that you see that come back from Mars uh, are from cameras that were built here at the University of Arizona. And so, uh, you know, as students here, uh, you know, our students interact with these groups and help to design and build these, uh, the, these types of things. Uh, another uh, set of cameras uh, that uh, were developed here are on the OSIRIS-REx. So as Tom had mentioned, um, the OSIRIS-REx is a uh, small um, spacecraft uh, that's going out to a uh, asteroid and it's going to orbit and map uh, that asteroid and then it's actually going to land on the asteroid, take a sample, and then send that sample back to Earth. And as you can imagine, there's a whole series of cameras on this in order to do the mapping, in order to see where you're going so you don't smash into, uh, into the thing. And so you can look at the surface and the sample and that kind of stuff. And so again, a lot of these cameras were developed here at the 
uh, University of uh, Arizona. Uh, now, those are, are you know, basic cameras uh, and cameras that are, are space-based. What about uh, trying to build a uh, camera uh, that operates slightly different than what you're familiar with? So typically we think about having this series tu tubes of lenses, and it takes one image, and that image is, is kind of static, and we can play with it in Photoshop and, you know, just the colors and the contrast and, the, and those types of things. Uh, but here's a, uh, an example of a different type of camera called a planoptic camera. And so this one operates much more like an insect eye. And so inside the camera, it has an array of tiny lenses. And if we zoom in here, each one of these tiny lenses is taking an image of a uh, portion of the scene, very small portion, but it looks at it from all different directions. And so this allows you to do uh, something fairly cool. Let me uh, break out of here for a sec, bring this up. Uh, let's see. So this type of camera lets you do something cool. So here's a uh, picture of a chessboard. And the original image is, again, these sort of uh, individual little tiny discrete images of, of sub-portions of uh, the image. And so from that one single image, we can generate a whole slew of images. So we can do things like um, look at this image from different perspectives. So a little higher, a little lower, uh, left and right. This is all coming from one single snapshot image. You can do things like uh, change the depth of focus of this. And so here I've uh, opened up the aperture of the camera, even though I haven't really done that. This is all done uh, computationally. And now I'm focused on the uh, back portion of the uh, of the chest set here, but let's say I want to focus somewhere else, I can, uh, I can focus up close as well. And so this is a different type of camera that uh, gives you sort of a, a uh, broader range of uh, images that you, that you can obtain with it. So those are all visible cameras. Let's start exploring some other uh, wavelengths as well. So uh, here we are um, in the uh, long wave infrared. So this is about, uh, uh, operates from typically 8 to 12 microns or so. And um, at, uh, at these wavelengths, hot objects start to uh, radiate uh, at, those, uh, at those wavelengths. And so uh, what we're mapping here is really the heat or the temperature uh, of an object. And so uh, if you take your finger and you write along a surface, your friction in your finger will locally heat up that surface and you can see what was touched there. This is a chair where somebody was, uh, was sitting and then they've gotten up and their body heat has been transferred to the, to the fabric of the chair. Uh, this is somebody just kind of scraping uh, their foot along the, the ground here and uh, palm print on the, on the wall here, okay? And so by operating at these different wavelengths, we can uh, get different information about our, uh, our environment. Here's another example of an uh, infrared camera. This one's operating in the uh, near infrared. And uh, these images were taken by uh, Charlie Falco, who is a, a faculty member uh, here as well. And so besides uh, uh, teaching here, one of his big areas is, uh, is in art and art history. And uh, so uh, he developed some inexpensive systems for uh, looking at uh, um, these uh, historical paintings and trying to do things like see if there's damage uh, to the paintings. And so this particular one's with a near infrared uh, camera. So this is about uh, one micron. So this is beyond uh, what our eye can perceive, uh, but still uh, uses a, uh, a standard uh, image sensor. And so on the left here, you see the 
uh, image in the, uh, the visible. This is what we would perceive when we look at it. But when we look at it in the infrared, you start to see all these defects in the surface here. And so there's places where, where the paint is separating from the, from the um, substrate and stuff like that. And conservators can use this information to try to fix and uh, preserve, um, preserve uh, the paintings. Let's go the other direction and uh, let's look in the ultraviolet a bit. So uh, here is an ultraviolet camera. And so uh, this is a picture of a woman putting on uh, sunscreen. Okay, so in the visible, you see kind of the white cream that after you rub it in a little bit, it becomes invisible. But if you take a picture in the ultraviolet of that, it looks like mud. And that's actually a good thing because you want it to look like mud in the ultraviolet because it should be absorbing those ultraviolet rays and not uh, letting it uh, penetrate into, uh, into your skin. So, so these are examples of uh, looking at um, uh, different wavelengths and using those to, um, uh, to record images. Let's go the other direction now and let's say we have a source that's in the ultraviolet. So uh, one ultraviolet source is uh, something called an eczema laser. Um, this is a, uh, um, a mixture of argon and fluoride gas that's used as the gain uh, media uh, for the laser. And it uh, uh, radiates at uh, wavelength 193 nanometers. So uh, again, uh, in the, well into the ultraviolet. And uh, these are some photos out of the original developers uh, lab notebook uh, that he was kind enough to, to send me. And so as he was developing uh, the eczema laser, um, he was home for Thanksgiving holiday. And uh, after dinner was over, he said, I have a great idea. I think my laser will interact with biological tissue. And so he brought uh, the turkey carcass into uh, work on, uh, on Monday and ran some experiments. And so um, these are um, bits of uh, turkey cartilage here. And uh, the first one is with uh, an argon laser, 532 nanometers, so in the green. And so when you zap cartilage with that, what it does is it burns the material. Okay, it chars it and burns it and leaves around this nasty uh, residue and damages the cells immediately surrounding uh, the area. So it's kind of like when you burn your skin, the area around it gets all red and inflamed because it's been, been damaged by the elevated heat. At 193 nanometers, however, the um, molecular bonds of the cartilage material literally just fall apart when they absorb that uh, radiation. And so what it does is it uh, ablates, removes uh, this tissue uh, without uh, very much damage to the immediate surrounding tissue. So it's a very clean and precise way of modifying the shape of, uh, of biolo biological tissue without causing a lot of, of harm to it. So what can we use this for? Well. One thing is we can shine this thing at our cornea, which is the clear membrane on the, the front of your eye, and we can sculpt it to a new shape. So if you wear glasses or contacts, one of the problems is your cornea is the wrong shape. So let's make it the right shape. And so we call this procedure LASIK. Anybody here had LASIK? No, you might not after watching this, this video. <laughs> All right, so this is always a good one for early in the morning, right after you've had breakfast and stuff like that. So, so this is a, uh, a uh, LASIK procedure. You can get it for $9.99 at your local uh, ophthalmology office. And uh, it uses the uh, eczema laser in order to, uh, uh, in order to uh, do this. Oh, it gets much better than that. So, <laughs> so that's just a little ink mark. Uh, and... Uh, this is where it starts to get a little, a little gruesome. So, <laughs> so this is a uh, little suction ring here, and there's a track on either side here. And what we're going to do is we're going to suck the eyeball 
up in here, just to hold it still for a minute here. Clockwork orange, anyone? All right, no? Okay. This is a mechanical blade, okay? So it's a razor blade, and there's a shave across the surface, and pull it off, and it doesn't go all the way across, but it creates a little flap or hinge in the, of, uh, in the front of your cornea, and the ink marks are so when you put it back in place, you can line it up and make sure it's in the, in the right spot here. So there's the flap, okay? So this is about a third of the way through your cornea. It's about, it's about 180 microns thick. So it's, just, it's like having a piece of skin come off on your skin. Here's a little targeting laser. This is an older, older system. So uh, this one actually is a sort of a video game where the surgeon has a joystick and uh, this, this targeting option here, and his goal is to uh, keep the crosshairs on the right spot while the laser energy is being uh, uh, deployed to uh, to the cornea here. Uh, modern day systems uh, take advantage of some optical engineering things called eye tracking, so that it automatically tracks the eye movement and then adjusts and compensates the laser delivery in order to do that. So here, surgeons are kind of lining up with the pupil here, and being ultraviolet radiation, we're not going to be able to see the laser pulses, but what we will be able to see is some fluorescence from uh, the tissue. And so if you watch closely in a second here, you're going to see these sort of purple um, flashes, uh, disc-shaped flashes that are occurring on the cornea here. And so each one of those is a pulse from the laser beam, and it's vaporizing about a quarter micron of tissue uh, inside the cornea right now. See if we can. All right, so there's some more flashes there. You can kind of see them faint, faintly. Hold still. There's some more. All right, so each one of these is taking off a little bit of tissue and it's changing the shape. So it's going from this shape to this shape and it's going to fix the person's nearsightedness. Wash it out a little bit. Put the flap back. Make sure your ink marks line up so there's no wrinkles in, in the flap and stuff like that. Smooth it out a little bit. And, uh, and this person can sit up from this procedure. So the whole procedure here took, what, a minute, two minutes of actual actual procedure, and this person can sit up and look and see the eye chart across the, uh, across the room, and after about a day or two, uh, they will gain the full vision that, uh, um, that they uh, can get uh, glasses, glasses free. All right, what else can we do with lasers? So, <laughs> all right, you made it. So I got one, one more if we have enough time, but, but uh, we'll see where, where we get to here. So um, what else can we do with, uh, with lasers here? So, um, well, you've all seen the barcode scanner, uh, that type of thing. And so basically you're putting out a little beam of light and looking at the reflectance off of that, and uh, you can um, encode information in, in these barcodes. So uh, very simple and old technology. Um, however, uh, you can start to uh, expand uh, this concept a little bit. And so with every 3D printer, you should have a 3D laser scanner, so you can uh, scan these little useless objects that you can then print out in, in cheap plastic for about... 10 times as much as you could buy it from, from uh, some novelty shop and stuff like that. But we can take this uh, scanner and we can do things like let's project a line onto a surface and then let's look at that surface from a different angle. And what that allows us to do is to triangulate on these positions here. So we know where the camera is, where we know the laser is coming from. And if we follow this path here, we can get the X, Y, Z coordinates of the surface. And as we scan that line over that, we can develop a 
3D computer model of uh, the surface. Well, okay, so what do we do with that? Well, we can go a little bigger uh, with this type of thing. And so this is a kind of a variation on this. This is uh, a technique called LIDAR. It's uh, like laser radar. You put out a pulse and you measure how long it takes for uh, that pulse to get back and then you scan that over over a scene and you can measure uh, very big objects uh, with this. So um, I know that there were some efforts to do some stuff in uh, Syria, uh, especially in Palmyra, uh, to measure some of the archaeological sites there before ISIS came in because ISIS just destroyed everything there. And so we at least have a three-dimensional record of uh, what was there in order to try to uh, reproduce or uh, conserve um, those, those types of things. Uh, I saw a very neat demo um, a few years ago where um, I was at a company and they put the LIDAR system out the window at the building across the street and you could actually see people in their offices uh, as the light had gone into their offices and, and had come back. And then the next thing is by uh, looking at the uh, motion uh, between subsequent frames, they were able to remove the leaves on trees because the leaves are moving between frames. And so anything that's static stayed and anything that was moving was taken out of the scene. And so you could literally strip the leaves off of, of trees and see through the trees like, uh, like uh, uh, they weren't there except for the, for the branches. Uh, you can take this technology and you can stick it on top of a car and now you have a way of measuring your uh, surroundings and uh, seeing uh, where cars and pedestrians are and stuff like that. And so this is the basis for a lot of the uh, autonomous uh, vehicles um, that uh, are prevalent uh, lately. And so uh, you have to be aware of your surroundings in order to drive around without uh, crashing into, uh, into anything. Uh, let's see. Another example of some optical engineering technology, uh, head-mounted displays. So these have been getting a lot of press in recent years. So it seems like uh, there's all the big companies and a bunch of uh, small startup companies are all coming out with their uh, version of the head-mounted display. Uh, and it's for all sorts of things like uh, uh, games or visualizing um, uh, internal structures uh, during surgery, uh, uh, putting up information for, let's say, soldiers uh, so they can get real-time maps or information about uh, uh, where they are. Um, one of the limitations of, uh, of this type of thing is they all sort of have this uh, form factor here where it's this big thing on the front of your face. And so there's a couple lenses in there and then there's a display uh, screen in there and that does two things. One, it gives you this big mass in front of your face uh, which is kind of awkward and the second thing is it limits the field of view uh, of the display and so you may only get a small section instead of a, a very large section. And so the way to fix that field of view issue is let's take those lenses that are in front of your face and get them closer to your eye and closer to your eye and closer to your eye and uh, if you get too close, your eyelashes, eyelids start to interfere with them and it becomes uncomfortable. So there's a limit as to how you can do that structure. But what if now you put those lenses into contact lens and you put the contact lens into your eye? So if you do that, uh, this is a company that has a contact lens and uh, the outside of the lens here is just your regular prescription, so when you walk around you can just see as normal. But in the middle here is a very high power uh, little bump. Okay? It's a tiny little lens, about a one millimeter in diameter, and its focal length is chosen so it can focus on the inside of your glasses. And so now instead of having the displays out here, you can put the displays right on the inside of your glasses. Um, they uh, put some filters in to the little lenslet here and into the outside here so that only the light from the display gets through the center part and only the light from the outside world gets through the outside part. And what that does is gives you a very high contrast uh, display 
that's superimposed onto the outside world uh, as, you're, as you're looking. And then on top of that, you wear a pair of glasses, but now the uh, displayed information is on the inside face of the glasses here. Yeah? Yes. Um, is that the same type of glass that's used in this study process? Uh, yeah, it's, it's something similar to that. So, so with the situation you just said, and then here, there's basically a hologram embedded into uh, the the uh, the lens here, and you're projecting light in from the edge, and it hits that hologram, and then and then scatters into the direction of the eyeball. No, it's it's displaying somewhere in the. It looks like it's coming somewhere in the world in front of you. Okay. So you can you can actually set the distances depending on how it comes out of the out of the stuff. It's just that little lens lets you focus on where the where the display is. Okay, well let's uh, let's take this uh, concept of putting a little bump on a contact lens and let's see what else we can we can do with this. So this little fun project I was working with with a couple friends a couple years ago, and so here we have a contact lens and. You can sort of see this little bump on the surface again. But now, instead of being able to focus on the inside of the, of the glasses, pick the power of that little lens so that you could focus underwater. Okay, so usually when you go underwater, the uh, focal length of your cornea gets dramatically reduced because the water uh, and cornea interface uh, can't bend the light enough. And so if we add a bunch of extra power to your cornea, you can now focus underwater. And again, you have an outside part here that is your prescription for seeing above water. And then light that goes through this uh, little center part here lets you focus underwater. And so now you have amphibious uh, vision. And so you can see both above and below water. And uh, doing eye tests underwater is a, a little more challenging, so you've got to find eye charts that are waterproof and, and stuff like that. So, but uh, here's a person with these contact lenses. They're reading an eye chart uh, underwater here. Uh, better than 20-20 uh, vision at all different distances. Uh, this guy's in his 60s, and so he's reading this eye chart all right, so anybody who, you guys are all too young, but anybody who's over 40, you know, when they start reading stuff like that, they usually have to start going like that because they can't focus up this closely. And that turned out not to be an issue uh, under underwater here. Uh, let's see. Here's another uh, interesting um, bit of uh, optics, and so, uh, this is a system that lets you see the invisible, okay? And so uh, this is called the Schlieren Imaging System. Oops. Go back here. All right. Maybe that one's not going to work. Is that? Nope. All right. Sorry, that one's not going to work, but... Uh, I'll get you guys the, the link to that. So, all right. So the last thing we're going to talk about is is what if you can't see at all? So how can we how can we fix that? And so uh, one of the um, causes of blindness is cataract, and cataract is basically uh, an opacity that develops in the crystalline lens. So your eye has the cornea on the front, and it has a crystalline lens that's behind the iris or the colored part of your eye and it absorbs ultraviolet radiation throughout your lifetime. And just like leaving a piece of plastic out in the sun, uh, it turns yellow, clouds up over time. And so normally in the Western world, we'll see something like this, and uh, we go ahead and fix it. But in many, many places in the world, you don't have uh, option or access to health care and after a while, your lens starts to look like this. Okay, so no light is getting into uh, this person's eye. And so 
uh, cataracts is the uh, largest cause of blindness in the world. Okay? Hundreds of millions of people are completely blind because they look like uh, on the, the right here. And it's completely fixable. Okay? And so uh, coming up with ways of diagnosing and treating uh, these types of things are, uh, uh, has a big impact on humanity. And uh, treating cataracts um, goes way back. There's all these sorts of brutal things from the 1500s, 1600s and stuff where they go into the eye and they pull out that lens. And uh, as we've gotten things like antibiotics and antiseptic and, and that kind of stuff, you can actually go in there and not have the person get an eye infection and lose their eye because of that. Uh, but the problem with just taking that lens out is that you are really, really farsighted. And so if you pull that lens out, all you have is your cornea now, and you've got to wear these big, thick glasses in order to uh, see anything. And back in the late 40s, um, there was a uh, surgeon in Britain uh, named Harold Ridley who came up with, uh, with this great idea on how we're going to fix, uh, fix people after cataract surgery so they don't have to wear these big thick glasses. And so what he noticed was that pilots during World War II, uh, the canopies on uh, Spitfire um, were built with a new material called Perspex. We call it plexiglass here, okay? So this is the sheets of plexiglass that you can buy at the, the Home Depot and stuff like that. But what he noticed is occasionally a bullet would go through that uh, canopy and a little shard of this material would embed into uh, the pilot's eye. And so he was an ophthalmologist who was treating uh, these pilots. And what he noticed is that there was no uh, biological response to uh, this material. So normally you get a foreign body into, uh, into you, like a, let's say a splinter. First thing your body wants to do is encapsulate it and it uh, co coalesces around it and then tries to reject it or get it out of your, your body and stuff like that. None of those things happened with uh, this uh, plexiglass uh, material. So uh, Ridley came up with this idea that he could make a lens out of, uh, out of plexiglass and put it in the eye after they take uh, the cataract out. And he told his colleagues about it. And they thought he was nuts. Right? They literally said, you're crazy. You're going to take a perfectly healthy eye and you're going to put an artificial piece of material in there. No way that this will work. And so he had to do some of his initial experiments uh, in secret. And uh, he performed uh, his first surgery and removed the cataract and implanted a plexiglass lens. And the person went from being about... Uh, 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 being farsighted to super, super nearsighted. Okay? So they were focused kind of up here. And so what he was able to demonstrate was, hey, I can change the power of the eye. He just changed it a bit too much. Okay? <laughs> and he did second surgery, and the same thing happened. And then they sat down and said, why is everybody coming out up here? And what re he realized was that um, what any optics person could tell you is that the index of refraction of the plexiglass is higher than that of the crystalline lens. And so by making, they made a plexiglass lens that was the same shape of the lens he was removing, means it had a shorter focal length than, um, uh, than the natural lens. And so it was making people really, really nearsighted. So by the third surgery, figured that out, changed the shape of the lens, and um, and then since then, um, he was able to convince uh, people that this is actually a useful thing. And now this is the standard of care. So when somebody says they're having cataract surgery, it means that they're taking the old lens out and putting this artificial lens in its place. And again, it's usually an outpatient uh, surgery. And I just happen to have another gruesome video uh, for you for the last couple of minutes here. And hopefully this one will work. I might uh, speed through this. So, 72-year-old woman. Um, these are just the kind of dimensions and refraction uh, of, of, uh, of her eye. Um, typically, if you live long enough, 
you will get cataracts, and it's from a lifetime of exposure to uh, ultraviolet. And here in Arizona, we tend to get them a little younger than uh, we do in other parts in the country for all our sun exposure. Let me see if I can... Speed this up a little bit. Of course, I don't know how to do that. Now, here you're making a little incision inside here. All right. So, one of the things that, that I do in my lab is I design the lenses that go into the eye here. And specifically, we design uh, bifocal, trifocal type lenses. And so when you put the artificial lens in here, normally you're frozen at a particular distance, but you'd like to be able to see up close, read a book, read your computer screen, and stuff like that. And so we develop these lenses that have multiple powers in them simultaneously so that you can see at all different uh, distances. So this is uh, removing a membrane that's on the front of uh, the cataractus lens. Anybody know how to jump ahead on here? All right, well, I'll just let it run. So um, let's, it, this one takes a while, so let's do some questions and stuff while, while it's going through. Yeah? Would it be possible for people to see better than while they were healthy after the surgery? Yeah, so, so with both, both this surgery and with, um, with uh, LASIK surgery. So with this surgery, typically what happens is, is that there's this progression of the lens getting yellower and yellower and more opaque, scattering more light uh, over, over many, many years before it gets so bad that they, they take it out. When you put the new lens in, it's crystal clear, uh, highly transmissive, and so, so people always state how bright the world is after, after they, they see this and, and stuff. With LASIK, we can actually measure the aberrations in the eye and then go back and, and sculpt the cornea to compensate for those to, to, uh, to give better vision. And so um, the goal there is no longer to give 2020 vision, but to give better, you know, 2015, 2012, those, those types of things. And so a lot of people can get to places where they don't usually go to. This is an ultrasonic uh, probe. So the end of this vibrates very high frequency. And you, press it against the lens and it breaks it up into little bits and it's hollow and it sucks out the uh, little chunks of lens there and uh, basically just vacuum, vacuums out the, the old lens and stuff like that. So, other questions? Uh, yeah, so, so typically right now most of your cataract patients, 60, 70, 80 years old, uh, and are doing it because of the opacities in there. Uh, there's a movement now to um, actually do this with a clear, healthy lens in order to fix your refractive error. And so there's some ethical questions there, but if you have really poor vision and glasses aren't working for you, it may be ethical to remove, uh, uh, remove the lens, a healthy lens, and replace it with an artificial one that will give you the right prescription. So. I'm sorry? What's the recovery time for your cataract surgery? Uh, typically, this person will, you know, surgery is about 20 minutes. Uh, they will go home after a couple hours after the surgery and come back, see the doctor the next, next day, and usually are seeing pretty, pretty good by, by then. So, so very, very fast. Yeah. So, your lecture, I'm wondering, but you seem to be focusing quite a bit on the study of the eye. And that is that your main focus in research? Yeah, so my, my research lab primarily works with 
uh, medical diagnostic equipment and um, and that kind of stuff. Uh, so a lot of uh, being able to measure the three-dimensional shape of the eye, measuring the aberrations of the eye, uh, being able to quantify the performance of these these implants and, and stuff like that. So. Uh, primarily uh, focused on the eye, pun intended. So, um, yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's the one slide that you, we had skipped earlier that you, and you said something about seeing the invisible. Could you could you give us like a brief overview of what that was going to be about? Okay. Um, let me see. We're coming into your your coffee break here, but let me see if I can pull that up on the internet um, quickly here, interweb. <laughs> yeah, so this is this is the. Oh. This is the video I was gonna gonna show uh, that somehow didn't get quite embedded into my uh, program, uh, but uh, it was just a light source and a uh, concave uh, mirror uh, for that, and then there's a camera next to the light source, and it's got a little razor blade covering half the uh, half of it. There's the razor blade, and so. Here's what the camera is seeing when it looks at the mirror, and you can kind of see the air currents uh, f uh, floating in front of it. And then here's lighting a candle. And so what this setup does is it takes uh, phase information, so distortions in the index of refraction of the air, and turns it into amplitude information, so uh, black and white uh, type of information. So it converts between those two and lets you see things like uh, uh, the plume coming off the the heated air that's rising off the the candle here. And there's a hair dryer. <laughs> Here's uh, helium into uh, a glass. So helium is obviously lighter than than air, so it's going to stay in the glass while it's upside down. Now it's pouring out, but pouring upwards and so. Sulfur hexafluoride is another clear glass, but it's heavier than air. So now you can pour it into the into the glass. <laughs> now it's overflowing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> My cup runneth over. <laughs> Go to the last drop. All right. So, I mean, the, the point of this talk is just try to show you some cool stuff that optical engineers do. Obviously, you have to understand how light interacts with different things and then, and then leverage that into whatever uh, application that you want. So, all right. Thank you and enjoy your coffee break.